All right, we're still talking volume responsiveness and cardiac output in uh, this topic on, in the Critical Care ECHO series. And this part two really is more about measuring cardiac output from ECHO and how we can use that to determine fluid responsiveness. So again, as a reminder, what constitutes fluid or volume responsiveness? Usually we refer to volume responsiveness when patients experience an approximately 15% increase in cardiac output with a fluid challenge of 500 mLs. And as we've shown before, that's achieve, that fluid bolus achieves an increase in the mean systemic filling pressure, which shifts the venous return function, and that if the patient's volume responsive, that will translate to an increase in cardiac output. So how do we measure cardiac output? Well, first we have to understand what goes into cardiac output. You know this equation by heart, right? Cardiac output is simply your heart rate times your stroke volume. Now, if you thought about it, and uh, hopefully you have, the arterial tracing, for example, on an art line tells you a little bit about cardiac output, right? So this curve that we get from our arterial tracing tells us actually what the stroke volume is. The curve is going to be shaped like how it's shaped based on two things, arterial uh, tone and then the amount of blood coming out with each beat from the heart. So stroke volume is actually reflected by the area under this curve, which is why when we look at a hypovolemic patient with an art line, we see not only small pulse pressures and a small area under each curve, but a significant degree of pulse pressure variation throughout the respiratory cycle. As plural pressure changes, the filling pressures, loading conditions of the heart change dramatically, so you get the significant pulse pressure variation. Now you've seen that in art line, these are actually a pretty good way to determine if somebody's gonna be volume responsive, for example, in sepsis or another critically ill situation. If they have pulse pressure variation throughout the respiratory cycle, they are likely to be. Well, what if I could do something similar with an echo? Let's say I don't always have an art line. And the answer is I can. So let's talk about how we can measure cardiac output with an echo and how we can measure stroke volume with an echo. So let's take this LVOT, my left ventricular outflow tract. If I know the area of that left ventricular outflow tract, and let's uh, say I want to look at it over time. So if I know this area, and I know what's happening to it over time, systole and diastole, I might be able to start to infer what my stroke volume is, right? So at least if I know the volume, right, this is a volume over time. If I know what this area is over and what's happening in this area over time, and the blood going through it, then I would at least have some part of my stroke volume, right? But there's probably some other factor I need here. And that's gonna be the velocity of blood over time. So I can start to overlap these two curves and I can get what is called the velocity time integral. So if I know the left ventricular outflow tract area and I know that area is fixed over time and I know what that velocity of the blood going through that area is doing over time, I get what is called a velocity time integral. So this is what we're looking at. We're looking at a stroke volume from echo that is simply derived from the area of my LVOT, which is pi r squared, and then the velocity time integral through that LVOT. Again, the area is fixed over time. This is not a volume. This is well, it's kind of a volume, but this is an area over time. And then if I can see what the velocity is through that area over time, I can infer what the stroke volume is by this equation. So how do I do that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. If I get a left uh, ventricular outflow tract measurement by looking at my parasternal long axis view and measuring the LVOT just below the level of the aortic valve right as the uh, aortic valve leaflets are opening, that's the start of systole, then I can get a sense of what this LVOT diameter is. And from that, I can infer the radius. Now, it's important to recognize that measurement here is actually, while simple, it's just a linear measurement. I'm gonna freeze my frame in a parasternal long axis view and I'm gonna measure this diameter Measurement is critical because any errors I make are going to be squared. So once I've gotten this diameter, I can get the area. So now I just need to know what's happening to the blood velocity through that LVOT throughout the uh, cardiac cycle. And in order to do that, I'm going to get some sort of view that I get a view of the LVOT and the aortic valve. Typically, this is a three chamber or five chamber view, apical five chamber. I want to be able to get my probe such that I can put my pulse wave Doppler sampling box just below the level of my aortic valve which is where I measured the, uh, the LVOT diameter, and I'm gonna measure that velocity over time. And I'm gonna get a signal like this, pulse wave Doppler, I mean, get a tracing of that velocity over time. So it's pretty simple, right? So here's an example. I had a patient, we already measured, the LVOT diameter was 2.0 centimeters. The patient's heart rate was 82, and I'm able to trace this curve, this LVOT VTI, and I might want to measure several of them and average them out, but let's say the VTI measures out at 20. What is my cardiac output? 
Well, you can pause here if you'd like. If you don't want to pause and do the math, although I recommend you do, here's what it looks like. Cardiac output is going to be my heart rate, 82, times my stroke volume. And my stroke volume is simply pi r squared, which is actually, in this case, 3.14. Since the radius is 1, it makes the math easy. Times 20, which is my VTI. And I get this number, 5149, 5,149. That's actually my milliliters per minute of cardiac output. So now I need to just divide it by 1,000 and I get my cardiac output. So that was pretty easy, right? So let's talk about how we can use these principles to measure volume responsiveness with our echo. Now again, we said volume responsiveness is when cardiac output changes by about 10 to 15% in response to a fluid challenge. Let's go back and look at that hypovolemic patient with pulse pressure variation on their art line. What would you expect to have when you're looking at the LVOT VTI? You'd expect to see the same thing. So if this patient is hypovolemic, if I'm doing my LVOT VTI, I'm going to get a pretty significant change in my VTI shape and size throughout the respiratory cycle. So my hypovolemic patient will have stroke volume variation, which will be evidenced by changes in my VTI size throughout the respiratory cycle. Now, stroke volume variation is a surrogate for cardiac output changes, right? Which is why we use stroke volume variation on an art line, as well as stroke volume variation through an LVOT VTI signal as a surrogate for determining fluid responsiveness. So if my patient is hypovolemic or otherwise is going to be fluid responsive, they're going to have significant stroke volume variation on here. And you can see that actually if we're looking at the um, looking at changes in stroke volume, the radius of the LVOT is relatively fixed. So really the only thing that's going to be variable throughout the respiratory cycle is actually going to be the LVOT VTI. So if you wanted to look at fluid responsiveness, you wouldn't even have to go through the trouble of measuring this LVOT radius or diameter. If you simply wanted to look at LVOT VTI variability, you could use that as a predictor of volume responsiveness. And if there's significant variability of the LTO, LVOT VTI throughout the respiratory cycle, you have a patient who's likely to be fluid responsive. Well, you might say some of the stroke volume variation crap too, and it kind of is, right? So we looked at the IVC ultrasound in the last talk, and we bashed the IVC ultrasound a bit. Um, now I'm trying to tell you that this way of doing it, it's better. Well, as you can see, the likely ratios really aren't substantially different than looking at IVC ultrasound. If you're just looking at stroke volume variation with an echo probe, you're not going to get much better than some of these other metrics that you've already probably been using, uh, like looking at your IVC volumetric changes over the respiratory cycle. So again, if we have this situation, we might say that that's not enough. Those, those data are not good enough for me. How can I further improve my ability to discriminate who's going to be volume responsive? Well, there's a way to do this, right? There's a way to try to determine responsiveness to a fluid bolus without giving a fluid bolus, and that's a passive leg raise. So if I give a passive leg raise, I can now look at my LVOT VTI after I've done the leg raise. And in my patients who are going to be fluid responders, I'm going to see about a 10 to 50% increase in the cardiac output. Now, of course, the problem is if there's some variability in the VTI to begin with, I'm going to have to probably average a few of these LVOT VTIs over the respiratory cycle to get a sense of what my cardiac output is. And then I'm going to want to do that after a passive leg raise and see what that cardiac output is going to be after the fact by measuring several LVOT VTIs again and averaging them. So again, when you're doing a passive leg raise, let's just come back to the physiology one last time. We are actually just increasing my femoral venous pressure, right? I am giving a better pressure head to try to improve venous return. Now, all of these other variables are constantly changing our critically ill patients. But if we are measuring our LVOT VTI over multiple beats over an entire respiratory cycle, these things are going to work themselves out. And in fact, the only variable that we've really changed in is the femoral venous pressure. The splanchnic venous pressure, pleural pressure, abdominal pressure, these are going to change throughout the respiratory cycle. But if we're taking multiple beats and looking at the LVOT, VT, LVOT VTI over multiple beats throughout the respiratory cycle and averaging them, we're actually going to be able to see if our cardiac output changes with a, a passive leg raise. So again, really the only variable we've changed in throughout the entire respiratory cycle is the femoral venous pressure. All that's to say that's why doing a passive leg raise and doing this with an echo is the best way to predict fluid responsiveness. So if, as you can see here, the likelihood ratios are way better than any of the other measures you're using, whether they're IVC ultrasounds or stroke volume variations on a pulse pressure monitor, on an arterial tracing, or even through the LVOT VTI method, actually measuring the cardiac output change with my passive leg raise is the best way. And again, the reason for that is the physiology is simple. We've made sure that all of these other things, even though they're changing throughout the respiratory cycle, have been neutralized by the fact that we're not measuring LVOT VTI throughout the respiratory cycle.
And if we're doing that, we are only manipulating femoral venous pressure, thereby we are only manipulating the mean systemic filling pressure, and then we can determine with relatively unequivocally whether or not cardiac output is going to improve or not with increasing femoral venous pressure. So that is the best way to measure volume responsiveness in your patients. Know how to measure the cardiac output, know how to do a passive leg raise. That is the way to determine fluid responsiveness with an ultrasound probe, not an IVC ultrasound. Thanks.